welcome home to Trinity, a place of sharing the gospel and growing God's family. And if you're visiting with us, we are so glad that you're here with us. We hope you feel right at home already. In fact, why don't we take a minute or two and just greet the people around you, in front of you, behind you, next to you. Take a minute to introduce yourselves. I've got a number of announcements, um, but before we get into those announcements, actually, let's just take a few minutes right now and watch this month's Wells Connection video. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Pastors are people too. That might seem like an obvious thing to say, but it's a reminder that pastors have all the same life challenges as the rest of us. New pastors are often just getting started in their roles as fathers and husbands, and they may wear many hats in the congregation. They can work a lot of hours and be pulled in many directions. For some, it's overwhelming, and they resign from the ministry. In fact, since the 1980s, about 500 Wells pastors have resigned. But there is good news to report. The trend is now reversing. Reverend Garrett Elford and his family have made a lot of moves. After four years at Martin Luther College, he moved to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. Preaching the gospel in the synagogues and telling people. Then to Texas for a year as a vicar and eventually on to Eden Prairie, Minnesota for his first call as a pastor. Yet in many ways, Reverend Alford's journey is just beginning. As a new pastor, he is well prepared in the word, but there are certain skills that only come from experience. When you first start with being a pastor, you have two thoughts at the same time. And one is, I know exactly what I need to do. And the other thought is, I have no clue what I'm doing. Understanding how to handle the personalities on a church council, for example, can take time to work out. The stresses of sudden funerals, budget shortfalls, and meetings every evening can take a toll. Pastors have particular things that they have to deal with that only other pastors are really going to understand. For some, the stresses can become too much, and they resign. In the last 30 years, as many as one in four new pastors resigned their positions. The good news is, we know how to address this issue, and the trend is reversing. The key is this, a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program that pairs new pastors with their more experienced colleagues. We have a structure in place in our church. He's going to have burdens to bear, and he doesn't have to bear them alone. One of the, the strong points of the mentor program is you've got somebody to go to immediately to say, uh, how do I get ready for this? What, what have you seen in your past? Uh, so a, a, a tremendous blessing to, to have somebody with that experience to help you. Reverend Alfred's mentor is Reverend Stephen Schmiel. They meet regularly to talk through issues, provide support and accountability. It is essential that anyone who is pastoring others be pastored. Pastors are not Christian rock stars. We're not better than anyone else. We have the same need for repentance. We have the same need to hear simply that Jesus died even for us. We're all still on that path, following Christ, carrying our crosses, in need of uh, encouragement, in need of accountability, in need of repentance and forgiveness. Lay people also have a role to play in helping their pastor by respecting his private time, offering words of encouragement, and supporting the mentoring process. And perhaps most important of all, lay people should be involved in ministry, since God's work is everyone's work.
Since the mentoring program was formalized in 2011, about 9 in 10 new pastors have requested a mentor. The percentage of participating pastors who've resigned has dropped precipitously to near zero. It's a reminder that God has designed us for relationships, and when we support and encourage each other, blessings follow. So as far as the announcements, a reminder that later today, the youth, or not youth group, the, the ministry group for uh, ages 21 to 31 has an outing. There's information in the service folder about that. If you have any questions, talk to David Kenyon here. Um, pioneers, both boy and girl pioneers, um, have an outing this coming Friday uh, going to Jack's Warehouse. There's information about that too. And this week is uh, Valentine's Day. And so if you still need uh, something special for your sweetie, um, you can get Mike Tam singers from Illinois Lutheran to, to sing a valentine to your sweetie. Uh, there's information about hiring them uh, in the service folder. And also if you want to get some sweets for your sweetie, LWMS, our, our group that supports missions around the world, has some yummy stuff for sale uh, in the fellowship hall by the, by the kitchen there. And then also, uh, Mr. Nate Hins, one of our teachers at Illinois Lutheran, has received a call, a divine call, to be a teacher up at uh, Trinity Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. So uh, certainly keep him in your prayers as he uh, figures out where he, he can best serve with the gifts he's, uh, God has given him. We'll certainly also have a prayer for him this morning in church. That is it for the announcements. Today we are continuing our sermon series. What's the big deal? Today, specifically, we see the big deal about Jesus is that he wants us. With that in mind, let's begin today with a prayer. Lord Jesus, who am I that you would have come to this earth to die for me? Who am I that you would have given your life for me? Who am I that you would have preparing a place for me at your side in heaven. Who am I that you want me? Lord, as I marvel at that truth today, build me up in your love. Strengthen me so that as I leave today, I may not know and be assured not only that you want me, but you want all those others out there as well. And use me, Lord, to share your love with them. We ask this in your name. Amen. Um, the entire order of worship is printed in the service folder. The, the, it's also going to be up on the screens. You can use whichever one you want. Our opening song, Who Am I? Who am I? That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Because of who I am, not because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here to take on tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean. Who am I that the eyes that see my 
Please stand for worship. Today, as we always do, we begin our worship in the name of our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come before our holy God, let us humbly join in confessing our sins. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Let me 
see redemption win. Let me know the struggle ends, that you can mend a heart that's frail and old. I want to know the song can rise from the ashes of a broken life, and all that's dead inside. It's my privilege to tell you that while we are worn, weary, and burdened, God is not. He never wearies of showing his love. He never wearies of showering us with his love. He never gets tired. And that is why he gave his son, Jesus, on that cross, who died for each and every sin that wearies us and wears us down. He rose triumphant from the grave, that indescribable miracle, to prove to you and me that everything he has done means we will be with him in heaven. And so I tell you, all your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Please be seated. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature. 
First scripture reading for today is um, from the first uh, from the Old Testament book of Judges, and it's it's a um, rather interesting section. Um, it's about the parents of Samson. His parents learned very clearly of God's amazing love that God wanted them, and that He wanted their son Samson. This is what ex- uh, Judges chapter thirteen says. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other ferment and drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah, that's the husband, prayed to the Lord, O Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. 
The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes? He replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We're doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, If the Lord had meant to kill us, we would not have accepted, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. This is the word of our Lord. Our next scripture reading is from Romans chapter 10, and this is an amazing section of scripture. Very clearly, how do we come to faith? It's by hearing about Jesus, but someone has to tell us about Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul says. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Let's join in singing a newer song for us, I Am Not Alone. Bye. 
My dear friends in Christ, back when I was in school, um, grade school, it didn't seem like we had a lot of choices in what to do for uh, recess or Fayette. It was a dodgeball, kickball, or maybe keep away. And um, I don't know if um, all the students here quite will understand this next picture, but the parents, yeah, we do. And sometimes this might even bring a little feeling of dread. When the teacher had two captains, and the captains then would pick from the rest of the students who was going to be on their team, things like this might bring some apprehension, some um, um, lowering of your self-esteem, because uh, unless you were the really most athletic kid, um, they were the ones picked first. And then the rest of us, well, it, it might be a real possibility that you'd be picked last. Unless... Maybe one of your friends were one of the captains, and then they'd, they'd probably pick you first, or at least one of the first ones, and that, that'd be a pretty good feeling. Because, you know, they want you. It's that same feeling for a very different situation, though. That's the focus of today. What's the big deal about Jesus? He wants us. Before we talk about God wanting us, we're going to take a little look at what Jesus did with um, a crowd and some of his disciples in Luke chapter 5. This is what it says. On the day Jesus was, one day, sorry, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Um, This lake had a whole lot of different names. We probably know it by the, the Sea of Galilee, exact same body of water. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put a little from the Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So the setting is, is there's a lot of people coming to Jesus, crowding around him on the shore there, trying to listen to God's word. But there on the shore with the people pressed in, he, he can't talk to that many of the people. So what he does, in a sense, he uses a natural uh, PA system, public address system. They didn't have microphones or speakers back then. So, so he got in a boat, little out from shore, and 
and the voice carried across the water to the people on the shore. If you've ever watched some YouTube videos or been out on a lake, you know just how far a little sound can travel over the water. That's exactly what's happening. He is there so that the people can hear. Now, he, he got in this boat, and um, you know, it, it wasn't like he got in a, a stranger's boat and asked them to put out the shore. Simon, who we probably know better as Peter, had already been a disciple of Jesus. So this wasn't some stranger's boat Jesus got in. And besides, Simon Peter was right there with Jesus in the boat. You see, Peter and, and these other fishermen who were his partners were disciples of Jesus. And I probably have to explain that a little bit. A disciple back then was someone who, who was a student, who, who learned, who listened, and, and studied in a formal setting under a rabbi, a, a teacher. They followed the rabbi. But can't even use that word follow today because today with social media, follow means you, you click and, and you, you passively receive some posts from another person. That's not what it meant to be a disciple. It was not a passive thing. You listened, you, you learned, and, and, and you followed. You, you, you did. Well, after the people heard Jesus, Jesus wanted to teach Peter specifically. And so the gospel continues. When they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've worked hard all night and, and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Jesus wanted Peter to learn trust. Did, did you catch what uh, Peter and the other fishermen, his partners, had been doing in the first few verses? They were cleaning their nets. They were done fishing. They had fished for hours throughout the night, hardly had anything to show for it. They were done. But Jesus is teaching Peter to trust him. And right behind trust, then, is obedience. The gospel continues. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They, they singled their partners in the other boat to, to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So, Jesus was teaching Peter that he, even though what he was saying was completely counter, opposite everything they knew, you, you, you see, on that lake, the best time to fish was at night, and it was not near shore, or it was not on the deep. It was kind of near shore. What Jesus told them to do was completely opposite everything they knew and everything they had experienced on this lake. It was, it was completely opposite the, the, the manual, if you will, the training manual. And yet Peter trusted, and he obeyed. And the result was amazing. The gospel continues. When Simon Peter saw this, this huge catch of fish, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Do you see how Peter reacted? He, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Get away from me, Lord. I, I'm a sinful person. You see, Peter, he, he, he had seen Jesus perform miracles before. Um, the, the water into wine. And a few weeks ago, we, we saw that that shows us God, He cares about the little things in our lives. Not long before this, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, but now that this, is, this, is, this is personal. And, and, and he, Peter, he, he wasn't 
Well, Jesus was there and, and the, okay, Peter was no saint. Okay, he, he's a fisherman. I, he probably had some choice words he said while on the lake. And, and I know they didn't have um, reality TV shows back then. If they have a reality TV show about Peter they, and they put it on an air, they probably would have beeped out a whole lot of things he said. And there he is, face to face, with that, that power, that, that, that holiness. And, and that's not Peter. But Jesus still had more to teach him. The Gospel says, Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's okay. Whatever you're embarrassed about in the past doesn't define you. I want you. I forgive you. I want you, and more than that, I, I have something for you to do. I, I want you. you. You know how to catch fish. Now, I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. Jesus taught Peter his love. And in so doing then, showed Peter he, he had a role. And then another amazing thing. What, what did Peter and the other disciples do? They, they, he had to call that other boat to come and help because the catch was so big. And, and Jesus is teaching there also that you know, we need each other. And they pulled it to the shore. And, and what did they do? They left it and followed Jesus. They left everything they knew, everything familiar, and, and followed Jesus. Now, now, like I said, before this, they were disciples of Jesus. It was just, um, they still had their full-time day job, fishing. Now, they gave that up. And, and no, you know, this involved a sacrifice. They left their livelihood. They left what they knew to go be with Jesus full-time. Today, we call people who do that, I guess, called workers, right? Our job is all the same, to go fishing for people. It's, for some, though, it is their occupation, their full-time job. And when that happens, for all of us, it does mean sacrificing. Leaving what we're comfortable and familiar with to go fishing for people. Now, I want to show you a picture, and I, I, I love this picture. This is a picture of Mr. Rick and Mrs. Rick. Mr. Rick's one of the teachers at the junior high high school at Illinois Lutheran, and Mrs. Rick is our, our preschool teacher. This is the day they found out, the moment they found out, that they were leaving what they knew and coming here to Crete. What joy, what surprised what wonderment that, that God wanted them to be here. That's the same joy and wonderment. God wants us. Now let, let's for a moment go, go back to Peter here. He, um, he was taught to catch people. And about three years after this, on Pentecost Day, he cast out the net of the gospel and he caught 3,000 people. He wanted Peter to learn, and, and he did. Jesus also wants us to hear. And let me just say this, right? Hearing God's word is a big deal. Children, you who go to Illinois Lutheran, what you hear every day it is a big deal. You hear about Jesus. Parents, when you bring your children to church, they're hearing 
a big deal. You are hearing something that is a big deal. It, it took Jesus significant effort to make sure that the people that crowd on that shore heard God's word. He goes to great effort to make sure that you can hear God's word too. Right? He made sure the Bible was written down. He made sure it, it was not tampered with, but it is clear and it is what he wanted us to have. He made sure it's been translated into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of languages. We, you can buy a copy. You can go online and read it for free. You can listen to it. You can watch it online. You, you can, you know, in, in, in all of history, we are at a time when it is the easiest to access the Bible. He wants us to hear it. But that's not all. Jesus also wants us to learn. To learn just like Peter did. Learn to trust. Even when it's hard to do so. Learn to obey even when everyone else is doing something completely different. He teaches us the same thing he taught Peter. You ever felt like Peter did in that boat? Jesus, get away from me. I, 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 I'm a sinful person. You know, we, we can just say the words without meaning it, but have you ever felt that, that terror that, that horror at yourself. What Jesus said to Peter, he says to you, don't be afraid. I want you. Those things in your past, they do not define you. I want you. I forgive you. I died on the cross for you. That's what Jesus says. I want you. And more than that, he says that he has a role for us. Just, just like Peter, he, he wants us to be fishers of, of people. You know, really what this is, this is, this is grace on top of grace. You know, just a few weeks ago, I, I declined. I'd returned that call to, to be a pastor at another church. And going through that process, it, it reminded me once again how much grace God gives us on, on top of grace. It, grace means undeserved love, right? It is grace, undeserved love, that, that God sent His Son Jesus to die to die for us. It is grace on top of that grace that God would send the Holy Spirit to give us faith, trusting what Jesus did for us so that we receive the benefits of it. It is grace on top of that that the Holy Spirit would give us spiritual gifts, each unique gifts. And then it's grace on top of that that He gives us opportunities to use those gifts. It's grace on top of that that He wants us to fish for people. He wants us. So let me just say this to the parents. Actually, to the dad. You have a very unique opportunity to go fishing. Not in a lake out in nature, but in your house. To spread the net of God's Word for your children. Dads, the statistics are staggering. For those children whose dads come to church compared to those who don't. 
If you want to know what the statistics are, catch me after church. I'll share them with you. For all. (laughs) He wants us. Not just to be in His kingdom, to be a part of His kingdom. To cast the net and go fishing for people. Now, um, back when I was in school, and you had captains picking the teams, sometimes you might feel good if you got picked pretty early, or sometimes you might feel bad, but that only lasted until the bell rang, and that was all over. Jesus wanting us doesn't end like that. And that is why he's a big deal. Because he, he wants us. Not just now, but forever. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which transcends our human understanding, guide your hearts and minds until life eternal. Amen. Let's join together in confessing our faith. We use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We bring our offerings to honor our Lord. Please be seated. Oh, how you
Somehow you want me, oh how you love me, somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Oh God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me, oh how you love me, somehow that frees me to take my hands up and give you control. This morning we include several special prayers. We include a prayer for Shelly Thompson, who will be undergoing surgery this week to remove a, a tumor from her pancreas. We include a, a prayer for Mr. Hins as he uh, deliberates the two calls that he has. And also a prayer of thanks as John and Mary Dorn rejoice in the birth of the first grandchild. Please stand for prayer. Lord God Almighty, we join you in, in praising you, uh, join uh, John and Mary Dorn in praising you for the gift of their grandchild, Leah Ruth Kotecki. Lord, keep uh, their granddaughter and the mother safe, and, and Lord, bring little Leah into your kingdom through baptism. Keep her in your kingdom until life eternal. And Lord, we ask for your blessings on Shelley Thompson as she undergoes surgery this coming week. Grant success uh, not just through the doctors and the surgeons and those who care for her, but grant also her your presence, your love, and a good recovery. And Lord, also we ask for you to be with Mr. Hins as he um, deliberates whether to continue serving here or to teach at Trinity Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Give him wisdom and understanding to know where he can best serve in your kingdom all to your glory. And Lord, hear us as we join in the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I have a question I need to ask you. Can it be true what they say? That I could be this failure and claim victory anyway. And it's all because of. against me 
Who? 